hello hope you're having a good day wherever you are um we're back with the liars club we're nearing the halfway mark i think we're, we're two or three pages off um so we're just gonna try to get through as much as we can with this video here um starting with chapter eight fresh off with chapter chapter eight page 158 after they took mother away, I sank into a fierce lonesomeness for her that I couldn't paddle out of into other things, nor did anyone come into it looking for me. By this, I mean that daddy never mentioned the night of the fire, nor did he say when mother might come home, other than pretty soon. Maybe our own silence on the subject, Lisa and Lisa's and mine, for we didn't bring it up either, was meant to protect him somehow so as not to worry him over much. If we failed him by not telling him all about it, he sure as shit failed us by not knowing how to ask. At school, I cleaned up my act. There wasn't cussing or fighting, and I won not a single exile to Frank Dolman's office for chess. My final report card for second grade shows my getting satisfactory plus in both conduct and citizenship, which was for me a first. No doubt I was operating under the notion that being completely good in the eyes of all authorities might urge mother back. At home I also picked up my side of our bedroom and grudgingly helped Lisa make our bed with military tucks on the sheet corners. There was there my housekeeping stopped, though she pulled off a whirlwind scrubbing of the whole house every Saturday down to the inside of the toilets. She wrought particular hell on daddy's ashtrays. He couldn't thump the ash off a camel without her swooping down to wash and dry the ashtray before he got his hand drawn back good. Without real data data, data, on Mother's psychic health, or lack thereof, Lisa and I cooked up some fairly worrisome scenarios about her. On TV one night, we watched a movie called The Snake Pit. It starred Olivia de Havilland. As this fairly nice, if somewhat high-strung lady who wore over-brooches -bro and belted dresses when vacuuming her house, but who nevertheless had a twitchy mouth early in the movie that foreshadowed her hellacious capital B breakdown later. The film's title captures how the mental ward got, got portrayed. There was an icy bathtub in which one maniac got dunked under wet canvas and a description of shock treatment and went something like this. Then the electrodes are fixed to the temples and zzz, thousands of volts course through the brain. Finally, poor Miss de Havilland got locked in a padded room and belted into one of those long-armed straitjackets that force you to hug yourself all day, and besides which looked really hot. All the while, she was hallucinating snakes crawling all over. That was the picture of mental ward life for full-blown nervous that Lisa and I promptly settled on. It was all we had. The neighbor kids gave little comfort. Like us, they ran short on real data about psych wards, but they were very long on mean-ass idiom. To this day, it's a peculiar trait of Leechfield citizenry that your greatest weakness will get picked at in the crudest local parlance. In fact, the worst an event, the worse an event is for you, the more brutally clear will be the talk about it. In this way, guys down there born with shriveled legs get nicknamed Gimpy, Girls with acne, pizza face. Sorry, I just got back from walking. I'm a little breath. <laughs> anyway, bottom of 159. My daddy even worked with a guy whose teenage son had gone berserk with a 12-gauge shotgun and marched one summer day into the junior high where he shot and killed a guidance counselor while the principal, the alleged target we later heard, hid in the school safe. The men on daddy's job right away nicknamed this kid the ambusher. The week the local paper carried, I guess in the story, a story about the boys' incarceration and the bottomy in the state hospital at Rusk. The guys at the refinery pitched the kids' daddy a party complete with balloons and noisemakers. I shit you not. Daddy claimed that the card they gave the poor fellow read, Here's hoping the ambusher can finally hang up his guns. This kind of old face ugliness was common to us. The theory behind it, held that not mentioning a painful episode in the meanest terms was a way of pretending that the misery of it didn't exist. Ignoring such misery, then, was equal to lying about it. Such a lie was viewed as more cruel even than the sad truth because it somehow shunned or excluded the person in pain, i.e., in the above case, the ambusher's daddy, from everybody else. 
Plus, ignoring such a grotesque event as the lobotomy of one's only son would suggest that the guy was somehow made weak by it or couldn't take it. So neighbor, hit, neighbor kids talked to me in language meant to toughen me to the cold facts of my life. I heard how mother was as crazy as a mud bug and nutty as a fruitcake. She didn't have both oars in the water. She had been slam dunked in the loony bin, the funny farm, the mental Marriott, the ha ha hotel. I got my ass whipped three or four times by jumping like a buzz saw into kids popping off this way about her. Finally, daddy urged me to start biting down hard on any kid getting the better of me. He knew that to back, he knew that to back up would bring a steady stream of ass whippings and my size precluded any bona fide victories. I'll see her dad's like egging her on. <laughs> Lay the ivory to him, Pokey, was how he put it. Even if I got whipped after, a bite mark left a bite left a mark that stay with the person. That summer, I bit to draw blood seven or eight times. But the time I took a good chunk out of Ricky Carter's shoulder ultimately led to events that cinched my reputation as the worst kid on the block. The red-faced Ricky, who was 12 and couldn't bear having busted into tears in front of the littler kids after I'd chomped on him, scanned around for a way to get even, then jumped on Lisa. Jumping Lisa always proved a mistake. Ricky was older and way bigger, but she was tough as a boot. She couldn't walk into the drugstore for an ice cream without some roughneck pointing to her and saying, that there's Pete Carr's daughter, which praise always caused some guy's eyebrow to cock itself north a notch. Anyway, Lisa had pinned Ricky pretty quick when his baby brother Philip came up behind her with a ball bat and brought it down with all his might between her shoulder blades, knocking her out. At the crack of wood against Spinal Column, the whole gang brought broke running back to their separate yards. Lisa toppled, and a few minutes passed before her cheeks flushed and her eyes fluttered open. Oof, these kids are brutal. The next day, right after dawn, I pulled down my BB gun from the top bookshelf and went on a rampage that prefigured what Charles Whitman, the guy who shot and killed 13 people from a tower at the University of Texas, would do a few years later. I stuck a can of hot tamales with a can opener in a paper bag and fixed myself a jelly jar of tea. While all the other kids were still sitting around in their pajamas, eating their donuts with, pop with powdered sugar and watching cartoons, I was sneaking across the blackberry field behind our house. There was a lone chinaberry tree at the field centers, and I shinnied up it and pulled my BB gun after me to wait for the Carter kids. They'd planned to berry pick that morning so their mama could make a cobbler. I'd overheard talk about it. I didn't wait long. The sun had gone from pink to hot white when the whole Carter clan clambered across the grassy di ditch circling the field's edge. Their daddy was leading them. They staggled behind, straggled behind, each with a saucepan or a bait bucket. I lifted the BB gun and sighted through its little V as close as I could to the white glare of Ricky's glasses. I fully intended to pop him between the eyes. I repeated daddy's injunction to pull any trigger slow. Don't jerk it, Pokey, he always said. I didn't, and after the satisfying little zing, a miracle happened. I saw Ricky Carter slap his neck like he thought a wasp had stung him. My next few shots missed, but Mr. Carter heard them skitter through the long grass and tracked the noise till he finally caught sight of my shape in the tree behind leaf cover. Even I could see the little bloody hole in Ricky's neck where I'd pegged him. Mr. Carter yelled my name, then yelled, was that me? But like Bra Brer Rabbit, I just laid low. Then he yelled, did I have some kind of weapon up in that tree? And Babby Carter dropped her pot and ran crying back to the road with Philip right behind her. Shirley took out running too. Her flip-flops slapped against her bare feet till she jumped, in, jumped the ditch and hit asphalt on the other side. Ricky put his hands on his hips like he was pissed off, but he stepped sideways so that his daddy stood between him and my chinaberry tree. You pussy, I thought, as if Ricky's not wanting to get shot or a defining mark against his manhood. Mr. Carter screamed to get down from there that I could put somebody's eye out with a pellet gun, and I came back with a reply that the aging mothers in that town still clicked their tongues about. It was easily the worst thing anybody in Leechville ever heard a kid say. Eat me raw, mister, I said. I had no idea what this meant. The phrase had stuck in my head as some mild variant on kiss my ass which had been diluted from overuse. I stayed clueless a long time, even after Daddy had phoned and ratted to, even after he'd spanked me with Grandma Moore's old handmade leather 
horse court itself an insult. I may have actually cried. The next day, I planned to pick up the Carter's driveway, believing kids from union families wouldn't cross such a line to play with them. With mother's oiled paints, I wrote placards for Lisa and me to carry. Mine read, prosaically enough, down with the Carters. Lisa's, the Carters fight unfair, but Lisa talked me out of it. My morning as sniper won me a grudging respect. Kids stopped mouthing off about mother. The anti-Carter campaign had brought me activity and a parcel of relief. Without them to plot against, I sank back into my lonesomeness for mother. I'm guessing that was around the time of the Carter's presidency, like Jimmy Carter. Hence why it was kind of like ironic and funny. Anyway, bottom of 162. Daddy had only one Liars Club story that told me about his own mom's meanness, and that dealt with the blistering quality of her whippings, which were such that he bragged about having stood them. The old lady would strike my ass too. Don't think she wouldn't, just as quick as Papa would. We're cleaning ducks, Daddy and I, and the other fellows, by nine this morning, we had bagged our limit. I'm scooping the guts out of a little teal duck, and Daddy's pulling feathers from the huge slackened body of our only Canadian goose. With one swipe of his hand, he clears a wide path in the feathers. Mama was tough as a wood hauler's ass, he said, and that's high praise. Back in the logging camp, wood haulers drove mule-drawn wagons of raw lumber, since their butts rubbed against unstri unstripped pine all day. They became badges of toughness. How many eggs y'all want? Ben wants to know. Everybody says three. He slides a big slab of Crisco into the black skillet. We stood here at Cooter's one room cap. We stopped here. That stood. We stopped here at Cooter's one room cabin to clean ducks and eat breakfast. It's on Chupeak Bay, just across the river in Louisiana. Not as big as a minute, my mother, Daddy says, but mean as a snake if you ever lied to her. So she was small, but mean. Shug Ben says with a straight face that he can't imagine Daddy ever lying. He's quartering the ducks and wrapping the pieces in white freezer paper for us to divvy up when we're back in town. Daddy tilts his head at Shug. Last time she ever whooped on me was over lying. I had got big enough to figure out I was too big to whoop. Hell, my arms was that big around. He stares into the wash tub full of ducks' carcasses and feathers at his feet like it's some oracle his mama's ghost is about to rise out of. When he's sure everybody's listening, he backs up to, to, the, to set the scene. Had come a hurricane that August, dumped umpteen zillion gallons of water in the Neches River high. Hi? Netches River, period. Hi? Question mark? I don't know if I understand that. He glares at each of us so we get the point. Lord God. Oh, he's like asking, like, was it high up? Yeah, it was. Lord God, that river was high. The room sits quiet. The only noises, the pops of eggs sliding in grease and shug folding up the butcher paper. For a split second, the word hurricane sends roaring out of my own head at me a memory of the orange bridge during Hurricane Carla, how the railing had come rushing sideways at the car through the rain. I s shake my head loose from that and get back to my teal ducks. It's sticky work. I remember that storm, Cooter says. He's got a little wire of excitement in his voice at the idea of, idea of actually being in on the story. Cooter, you was still shitting yellow back then, Ben says, if you was drawing breath at all. He breaks the yolks with his spatula so the eggs fry up hard. To get eggs like this in a truck stop, you say to the lady, turn, turn them over and step on them. Well, I remember one like it, Cooter says. Eh, we all remember one like it, Shug says. He's about fed up with Cooter, who's been bossing him all weekend because he's colored. Shug, get the outboard. Shug, you're shooting too soon. God damn it, Shug, I was saving them biscuits for later. Cooter is also just walking the edge of telling colored jokes. He uses Pollock and Aggie, but everybody, Shug included, knows that if there wasn't a black man holding down a chair in this room, they'd be N-word this and N-word that. Daddy says Cooter's just ig ignorant. Never seen anybody colored before, so it's not his fault. But it seems mean how nobody ever say anything back directly. I mean, the guys do try to corral him a little and keep him from being 
over much an asshole. But nobody flat out says, you're just picking on Shug because he's colored. It sometimes seems to me like we're not supposed to notice that Shug's colored or that saying anything about it would be bad manners. That puzzles me because Shug's being colored strikes me as real obvious and usually anybody's difference gets pounced on and picked at. This silence is a lie a peculiar to a man's skin color, which makes it extra serious and extra puzzling. Near the bottom of 164. Yeah, Cooter seems annoying to me. So I've been using that kind of annoying voice for him. Oh boy. Daddy's voice stops me wondering. Anyways, Mama told me and my brother A.D. flat out not to go into that river. Stay out of that river, boys. These boys drowned in that river. And we said, okay, but A.D. cut me a little look, and I know we thinking the same thing. Me and old A.D. go squat outside the window and talk real loud so she'll hear us. We say we ought to go down to the sawmill, see if Papa needs any help. We take off down the woods road, but soon as we hit the fork where she can't see, he forks his fingers like a road he's arriving at. We peel off and go yonder a ways. The rest of them boys was going to be down at the water, so that's where we want to be too. We got there and stripped down and down and dove just as straight in that river as a pair of butter knives. Daddy's done plucking that goose. Daddy's done plucking the goose and hands me the prickly body, prickly pink body to gut. He picks up a mallard. Its head is an iridescent green. When Ben was toting all the mallards up from the duck blind earlier this morning, all their, all their green shiny heads came together in this big red hand like a bouquet of flowers. But for their black eyes staring out, you could almost forget they're dead. And this was your oldest brother you was with? Cooter asked. It doesn't matter who it was, Cooter, Shug says. Goddamn if you're asking a son of a bitch I ever met. Cooter twists around in the chair and stares at Shug. Cooter maintains a bird-like way of twitching his head around that makes me think sometimes he's about to go clucking off across the room picking at the floorboards. It matters if I feel like knowing, Cooter says. Daddy draws back the mallet in his hand like it's a ball bat he's fixing to swing. I swear to God, I'm going to flail both your asses with this duck if you don't shut up, he says. He started it, Cooter says, then sinks back down in his shirt collar. Ben says to let it go. He's over at the stove, pouring off the extra grease from the skillet into the lard pot. Daddy takes a few swipes at the mallard to get everybody's eyes back on him before he starts up again. That evening, we head down through them, through them woods back home, and here comes Mama. She got her apron pulled around and tucked in her skirt so, so the brush don't catch it. She always wore an old blue flowered bonnet. Daddy fans his head, hands behind his head to show the bonnet. The sun was going down to the west, which was her right side, so that bonnet thawed, thawed, th apostrophe owed, maybe throwed, thawed a shadow across her face, kept us from seeing her, but I could tell by how she was stomping through those weeds that she was mad. Plus, she had already cut herself a piss elam pole about as long as she was tall, like she'd got it in her head already to whump us. I whisper over my shoulder to A.D. not to tell her where we went. Just to say we watched the other boys. Or not to tell her we went in. Just to say we watched the other boys. And he says, okay. Not a minute later, she stops square on that path in front of us. In front of me. J.P., she says, you go in that river? No, I says. We just watched them other boys. And she says, fine. Then she reaches that pole around behind me and taps A.D. on the shoulder. Just light enough to get his attention. A.D.? Did you go in that river? And damn me if he don't say yes, I'm, I went in and he come in with me. And I thinks to myself, you sorry son of a bitch. I watch Ben draw a cake pan of biscuits out of the oven. He uses a pointy bottle opener to pop a triangular hole in a brand new yellow, yellow cane of sugar cane syrup. Can of sugar cane syrup. I like to pull, poke a hole in a biscuit with my thumb, then fill it up with that syrup so it gushes out the sides when you bite down. I figure on doing that, which fills the back of my mouth up with longing for the sweetness of it. I'm still holding that sweetness like a thirst when Daddy starts up. Let me tell you, fellas, my mama at this time wasn't no bigger than Mary Marlena here. He jerks his thumb at me so I can prove my mother's tininess. 
I ignored this by faking big time interest in slitting open the fat belly of this goose. Probably didn't weigh 90 pounds with boots on my mama. Anyways, she took us out on the screen, screened in back porch. We slept out there in the summer, started in on him with that pole and liked to have killed him. Brought it down on his back in a narrow swatch like she was trying to cut a groove through his flesh. I'd laugh like hell every time his eyes caught mine. I figured she was getting wore out on him, so as my turn wouldn't be as bad. She, Shug says, my daddy beat me and my brother that a ways, taking turns so one watched the other. Now you're interrupting, Cooter says, slapping the table. Why don't nobody stop him interrupting? The veins are standing out on Cooter's neck. Ben tells him to get the plates down and stop feeling sorry for himself. Daddy drops a mallard in the tub like he's all of a sudden exhausted by thinking again about that whipping. The whole burden of it seems to fall on him full force, his shoulders slump. The lines, the deep lines of his face get deeper. Then he gets an unfocused look at the middle distance like he's the beating's happening right there in the room. And all he has to do is watch it and report back to the other guys. That pole of hers cut the shirt right off my back in about four swipes. His head drops lower as if under the weight of that pole which is getting easier by the minute for me to imagine. I've had grown men beat on me with tire irons and socks full of nickels and every conceivable kind of stick. But that old woman shrunk up like a pullet hen, took that piss elam pole and flat set me on fire from my shoulder, shoulders clear down past my ass. And every time she said a word, she brought down that pole, brought that pole down. Don't you lie to me don't you run from me hell i broke loose from her a couple times and i run to the screen door but the pine boards on the old sleeping porch was swole up from that rain the door was swole so i couldn't pull it flush all the way couldn't get the latch unhooked i just about get it wiggled tight in the frame and then that pole would find me my back again you could hear it coming through come whistling through the air just a heartbeat before you felt it and Mama behind it, just hacking at me like I was a pine. And, and like I was a pine she was trying to knock over. I was scared to fall. Scared I wouldn't live to get vertical again. I promise you that. You think she was wore out on AD? He squints at us. Then he picks up the mallet again and picks at a few of the quills like he's winding down. Hell, she just warmed up on AD. They hate that when you run, Ben says. He's sliding the last egg onto the platter. My grandma was the exact way. Running just dragged it out. Of course, I'm famous for running in the middle of a spanking. It makes me proud that daddy used to, used to run too. I was figured only a dumbass would just stand still and take it. I have maneuvered my way over by the stover. Oh, this is her. Wait, this is her talking. Ah, okay. Of course, I am famous for running in the middle of spanking only makes me proud that daddy used to run too i always figured only a dumbass would just stand still and take it i have maneuvered my way over to the stove and then i level now with a plate of biscuits which have plumped up nice and brown on top the slightest blink from ben saying okay and i will snatch the first one i finally broke straight through the middle of that screen daddy says left an outline of myself clean clean cut clean around the edges of, as a paper doll Shug winks at me over the unlikeliness of this. He always keeps me posted as to the believability quotient of what Daddy's saying, even though I'm a kid and a notorious pain in the ass as kids go. Daddy sets the duck, sets down the duck again, and a smile stretches across his face. His eyes crinkle up, crinkle up, and his shoulders go square like the best part of the story just bubbled back up in him. And old A.D. had hell to pay. Don't think he didn't. Wasn't Uncle A.D. a lot bigger than you, Daddy? I am always trying to figure a way around my own skinniness. Uncle A.D. is a big oak tree of a man, white-headed and strong. In all the pictures of the car boys lined up, he stands close to Daddy and stares down his nose, like he's lording something over him. Don't make no difference bigger, Daddy says. Bigger's just one thing. There's a whole lot of other things than bigger pokey. Don't you forget it. Bigger's ass was what I thought. I head out behind the shed, Daddy says. And there's old A.D. hunkered down on the ground. Say, brother, I says to him. Daddy's voice as he makes out talking to A.D. To, uh, to, uh, Daddy's voice as he makes out talking to Uncle A.D. is smooth and sweet as melty butter. I believe you made out pretty bad back there, I tell him. 
I got some burn salve, may take that sting out. And A.D., he bends over, starts picking at the shirt on his back where the fabrics got stuck down in them sores. He's a hissing between his teeth. Gets that old cotton blouse pulled up over his shoulder blades, then asks me, does it look that, does that look bad? And I say, poor old you. Of course, she cut the shirt slap off my back. Pull your shirt off your neck a little higher, I says to him. I don't want to get this here salve on it. Piss mama off any worse. So he bends way over further, gets bent double leg, his arms all hung up in them shirt sleeves till he's stuck like a snake in a sock. That's when I grab hold to him, pour that old turpentine horse lin liniment down in them sores. Was a deep purple black liniment mama made from tar. I held him still and smeared it on with the flat of my hand and him wrestling me to break loose. Shug stops wrapping bird carcasses a second. He tilts his head at Daddy, then says that his mama cooked up some horse's liniment back then out of a tar base. See, Shug's from up in the piney woods, too. Hers was tar and pine sap. Hers was tar and pine sap. I remember, right? Maybe she put some lemongrass in it, one of them stingy herbs. Shug's mama knew Daddy's mama. They were both pretty good country doctors, and every now and then, Shug and Daddy ride back toward their mothers into that place to get something like this liniment or some other doctoring recipe. The looks back, the looks on their faces grow so vaguely soft that I start to feel tears in the back of my eyes. I'm verging on lonesome myself for these women I never, never knew. Daddy says that sounds like the exact stuff. He stands from the wash tub of feathers and slides over to the sink to wash up. He seems pleased. Shugs knowing the very liniment proves that the world daddy's telling exists. But Shug's brow has grown a furrow like it bothers him. He claims to Daddy that you couldn't get that stuff off you, not out of a cut or something. And Daddy says that was the very idea, to scald Uncle I.D. Uncle I.D. down to the bone for tattling on him. This sets me wondering. I hear about Daddy doing this kind of meanness when I see guys shy away when he strolls over to a pool table, but he handles me like I'm something glass. Even his spankings are mild enough to seem symbolic. When I got up cold this morning before we set out for the bayou, he warmed my socks over the gas heater before I pulled them on. Lisa was sleeping over at a friend's that morning, having outgrown daddy somehow, having also gotten agile at warming her way into families quieter than ours. My daddy buys me whatever I ask for and laughs at my jokes and tells me he loves me better than anybody about 50 times a day. I've seen him fight, but I've never seen this sneaky meanness that he talks about at the Liars Club. I look at him, scrubbing the blood out from under his fingernails with a pale blue plastic brush, and wonder about it. He's laughing like hell over what he did to A.D. Daddy pats his hands dry on a dish towel. I left old A.D. squirming on the ground, scrabbling to get away from himself. Then up ends the pan of biscuits, which fall out of the tin, a perfect streaming circle. They're crusty brown at the bottom. He nods at me to tear one loose, and I do but I have to hot potato it hand to hand to keep it from burning me. Finally, I drop it on the counter and cut my hands over it in a little igloo that I blow on. When I look up from that, I see Ben also has a dark look on his face, like he can't get away from the meanness of his this story fast enough either. Maybe it was Daddy's hint of low-lying meanness that kept me from asking about Mother over much while she was in the hospital. His silence on the subject was a fence I wasn't supposed to cross but I'd shoved past no trespassing signs before. So it was that one day when Daddy and I were riding home in his lizard green truck, my mind swam back to the night of the fire. By then I had blotted out Mother holding the butcher knife. I had even blotted out the fire itself and her burning our clothes. All my mind hung on to was Dr. Bordreau with his caterpillar mustache asking me where were the marks. I knew he'd checked Mother into a psych hospital. So I ventured out to ask about this place and why we couldn't visit. Daddy said that kids weren't allowed, being as how little bitty, bitty kids who saw their mamas on a locked ward with a flock of other folks in their pajamas just got scared. He turned away then and shook a camel loose from his pack and pushed in the cigarette lighter. That lighter was like the period at the end of a sentence. He was supposed to shut up my questions. I could feel my hair twist around my head in the hot wind. Through my window, I watched the rubber factory slide by. For some reason, though, I pushed past that moment. We were heading home from the farm royal 
where the car hop always leaned against Daddy's window while I drank my cherry freeze. She never brought a check either, even though Daddy downed at least three cans of beer. Maybe the beer might make him more apt to talk. I asked if he wasn't scared when he went to see Mother. Folks in that place, he said, didn't seem so much full-blown crazy as in really sad moods. They sat around over board games a lot, he said, not moving their tokens real often. That one detail about the game tokens turned the hospital real for me. All of a sudden, some black fury I'd been hiding boiled up. I finally told Daddy I didn't want Mother to come home if she was going to go all crazy all over again, just because we hadn't cleaned our room. Then he did something so apart from all I knew him to be that it immediately became the gesture that defined him most in my head. He turned the truck wheel sharp, so we bumped off the road, road shoulder into gravel. He slammed on the brakes. The truck fishtailed to a stop. Daddy didn't even turn to look at me. His eyes stayed pinned off to the side, either fixed on his own face in the side mirror or on the towers in the distance. This let me take in his profile. The sharp cheekbones, the hawk beak's nose. He, his eyes narrowed when he finally spoke. He said that if I kept talking about my mother that a ways, he would slap my face clear into next Tuesday. We sat there in the violence of that threat a minute, for he had never slapped my face nor even threatened to slap it. My face got over hot at the prospect, but I didn't make a chirp. After a second or so, he depressed the clutch and shifted back down into first gear, and we started back up the road. Near the bottom of 171. Daddy did finally take us to the hospital, a low brick building that sat in a scrubby field in blazing sun with no scrap of shade for acres in any direction. We didn't go in, but stood outside what must have been the day room. He'd arranged the time with Mother in advance. As we walked up, I could make out through the screen the extra layer of chicken wire mesh stapled to the window to keep folks from running off, I guess, the wild tropical print of her lounging robe. Daddy had to hoist me up by the waist to reach that window. Even then, only my nose fit over the bottom sill. Mother had her hand on the chicken wire. It was very white, and I put my hand to match with it, careful that I touched as much of hers as I could. The screen gave little, gave a little to let our palms actually meet through the chicken wire. Her face in the deep shadow of the room was just a pale oval without any features, but I could hear the crying in her voice when she said she missed us. She dabbed at the oval with a Kleenex and made snotty noises in her head. We took some more turns, saying we missed each other. Then I said something that caused Lisa to pinch my ankle. Sorry you're all locked up, I said, which made her laugh. Shit, honey, she said. You all are locked up, too. You're just in a bigger room. No sooner had she said that than from the far corner of the room, where I hadn't looked at all, there came a whole flock of giggly laughs that chilled me to the core. Peering over toward those laughs, I could see a vague knot of lady patients in blue nightgowns sitting at a large round table in a low gray cloud of cigarette smoke. It struck me that those were the other crazy people, but instead of being scared by their facelessness, I just felt disgruntled that they got to hang out with my mother all day. They ate meals with her and played gin rummy with her while I only got fetched up to the window like I was a big load of something she could hardly bear to see. My scene then prompted Daddy to lower me back down from the window. I said, I love you, and snubbed a little. Mother did the same, and then gradually she slid out of my sight. Lisa was taller, and so Daddy was able to heft her up higher. He locked all his fingers together into a kind of stirrup, then straightened his back so she rose to fill the whole window. It rankled me to see Lisa and Mother talk all whispery. I had, I had to poke my nose over the window ledge like some kind of bandit or peeping Tom. Lisa had her whole face up next to Mother's. Plus, I couldn't hear a word they said. Secrets had always moved between them. Nights when Lisa was mixing her martinis or changing record albums for her, Mother usually fell silent when I came into earshot. Lisa also had the habit of shooing me away when the two of them conspired. She'd flap her hand at me as if I were some horsefly to get rid of. They had some special hookup to each other, those two. Some invisible circle of understanding that they stood in together, while Daddy and I were exiled to a duller realm, in which mother had no had no truck. Anyway, that day at the hospital, when the white figure of the nurse finally came to stand behind mother, the signal for her to go, I guess, Lisa craned up her head for a goodbye kiss. She pressed, pressed her lips right 
up against the chicken wire. I wanted to smack her on the ass to cut off, smack her on the ass of her cut off Levi's, especially when mother's lips appeared through the honeycomb mesh to meet hers. When daddy was backing his truck out of the gravel parking lot, the tropical print mother wore came to fill another window and she put her hand flat up against the mesh. It made me think of a very white orchid I had found once sprinkled with some powder and mashed between the pages of Hamlet. That one visit was the only time we saw her all that month. That night, I fell right to sleep for the first time in weeks, and the worst dream came to play itself on the back wall of my skull like it was a wide-angle TV. In it, Daddy was hacking up some large, dead animal on the plywood table in the kitchen. I was walking across the dining room toward him, watching him through the rectangular window between the two rooms. I couldn't make out what kind of creature it was, deer or boar, or something big. Plus, Daddy usually cleaned his kill on the back patio over a wash tub so he could hose the blood off the bricks when he was through. His t-shirt was splattered with blood. The veins on his hands were raised up from the strain of the work. At one point in the dream, he lifted the cleaver and brought it down hard. Then he wiggled it to get through some grizzle, which he did with a click. I heard the cleaver thump clear through the bone onto the table's wood. About that time, Daddy caught sight of me and said to go back to bed. He was busy. Get on back to bed, Pokey, was how he put it. He hardly looked at me at all. I turned to go, but felt compelled to look back, as if magnetized by his task. He held up a part of the animal to study. Then the light changed, and he was holding an actual human arm hacked off at the elbow. At the end of that arm was Mother's hand wearing Grandma's wedding band. The wrist was bent, so the hand was at a right angle to the arm, as if Mother had held up the hand to say stop, and it had frozen that way. I gasped 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 that's a hard word to say gasped up from sleep my t-shirt pasted to my chest snails of sweat collecting on my upper lip it occurs to me from this distance that mother's chopped off hand from the dream was the same position as she'd pressed to the hospital screen but there was another hand from that time that also got seared into what i can remember it was the hand of bugsy juarez's wife it was covered in flour one morning she came to our back door. She pressed that white hand onto our damp breakfast table while she said to Daddy, Please come quick, Bugs has shot himself. She had been ma making biscuits when she heard the shotgun blast. He'd sp taken special care, she said, to cover over the garage door with the plastic tarp they used for their lawn furniture so it wouldn't be such a mess. And didn't we think that was kind of thoughtful, she said, as a last thing to do? She had a very dim smile on her face thinking of it. Daddy didn't answer, of course. He was too busy dialing the sheriff. Anyway, I remember that white handprint of Miss Juarez stayed on that table all day like a ghost had touched it. It put me in mind of Mother every time I passed by, till Lisa finally sponged it off just before supper. That is the end of chapter 8, and is also the end of part 1. And now we're in part 2, Colorado... 1963. There's a picture of, I'm guessing that's Lisa and Mary. Cuties. And there is a little quote at the beginning of this. A man's at odds to know his mind, because his mind is aught he has to know with. Know it with. He can know his heart, but he don't want to. Rightly so. Best not to look in there. And that's from Blood, Marin Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. All right. Chapter 9. We moved to Colorado wholly by accident. We were crossing the state heading for the Seattle World's Fair when Mother, who'd been staring blankly out at of the Impala's window cried out for Daddy to stop with such a screech that I figured she was carsick. They were both carsick a lot on that trip, plagued as they were by Smirnoff flu. We eased over. The road sloped down into a broad valley all embroidered with columbi columbine flowers and pink buttercups and white Queen Anne's lace. Beyond that stood Pike's Peak, which for a kid reared in the swamp looked unreal. In my chorus book was a similar mountain on the page facing America the Beautiful, a purple peak with a long wisp of cloud dragging across it and a snowcap. Stepping out of the car, air, that, our condi air conditioning that day 
was like entering that picture. How weird, I thought. Air is so cool. For in Leechfield, blue sky meant suffocating heat. Also, the smell of evergreen was dislocating, for it conjured the turpentine in Mother's studio. Being a champion powder on any car trip, I was pouting in this instance because we'd stopped. I also pouted sometimes when we didn't. I would pitch my shoes out the car window to force my parents to stop if, say, I was dead set on visiting some snake ranch or ice cream store I didn't wish to pee or didn't wish to pee squatting over the coffee can in the back seat with passing truckers peering down at my shining ass and pulling their ropes to toot at me like I was public amusement. The outdoor pool at the Holiday Inn in Colorado Springs closed at sunset. All day I dag nagged, nagged Daddy to get there in time. While we rode, I positioned my mouth about two inches behind his ear, prattling in a low insect-like hum, more or less nonstop, that we should get there too late for a swim. I was going to pitch a screaming cuss fit right in the motel lobby, but Mother wanted to pull over to take in the view. I chucked rocks at a tire's white wall. In my head, I worked up the fit I'd throw in the motel. I told the clerks this man wasn't my daddy at all, but had kidnapped me at knife point during a bank robbery. The thin air made me dizzy. I looked up. A hawk reeled overhead with a rodent squirming in its beak, close enough so you could see the bird's black, shiny eyes. That set Mother snapping away with her Kodak while Lisa bobbed about like a simpleton, waving her arm and yapping about the food chain. Daddy was lifting the hood to check the radiator level when Mother sashayed up to him. She tilted her head against his khaki, khaki shirt front and asked, Could we stay for a while, honey, please, since this light made her want to paint. I wanted to keep going. Lisa and I had unfolded the map from the Esso station to plot our course. We'd drawn li red lines in magic marker between the black dots of western towns to make a broad red light lightning bolt across the USA clear to Seattle. I wanted to hit the Space Needle gift shop so I could send Peggy Fontenot, Fontenot a postcard. Are they friends now? I'd worked on a draft in my cherry red diary with the flimsy key that mother had bought me at the drugstore before we left. Dear Peggy, doesn't this just beat your old Vatican Bible school with the rubber, hole, rubber hose? Hmm. Are they friends? Are they not friends? I don't know. <laughs> Bottom of 178. Daddy was occupied with whether to stay or go as he cranked the ignition, so the car bumped onto blacktop and the china blue sky started rushing across our windshield again. He finally winked at me in the rear view and announced that he wanted to keep heading west too, but Mother didn't. She argued politely at first and then in terms to make Lisa and me stopper our ears. In no time, the whole tone in that car had shifted away from whether we stop or not to make to more general terms. Who always did this and who never did that? Finally, Mother threw a matchbook at Daddy and he swerved off the road into a little town I'll call Cascade, where we wound up buying a house. The stone lodge Mother bought hung off the side of a mountain like something from a Roadrunner cartoon. Pictures confirm this. It looks like a good working car jack or even a serious nudge with a crowbar on the far side of that hill would send it toppling off its log stilts and rolling ass end over elbows down into the sharp dirt road into town. So it's like really on the edge of this mountain. It's gonna fly down, fly down the edge of it. The house proved how well grandma's money was fixed in to boost our overall comfort level. Back in Texas, we'd had hints. Before leaving, daddy braced air conditioners in the window of every bedroom. When we donated our black bladed fans to the Salvation Army, we moved into the county's upper echelon socially. Plus, in Houston, Mother bought herself a real leopard skin coat with a matching hat like the Cossack on the vodka bottle war. Maybe that coat, a torture to wear in our tropical climate, proved Mother never intended to come back to Texas from that trip, though she denied any such plan. But our trip west itself drew the boldest line between our family and the neighbors. Daddy only had three weeks off. He planned to fly back. Yes, fly. By plane. Miss Fontenot must have whispered across her apron lap of green shelling peas to the other ladies, leaving us without a man to squire us around. That was scandal enough. Living in a distant town without your husband? 
Mm. That was scandal enough, living in a distant town without your husband. Okay, that, I guess I was expecting more from that sentence. Perhaps more damning was to travel so far in the first place. In fact, I'd never known a family to set off for points farther west than the Alamo or farther east than the Crayfish Festival in Bro Bridge, Louisiana. New Orleans lay just 300 miles east, but it existed solely in lyrics from House of the Rising Sun. The day we pulled out of the driveway pointed at Seattle, neighbor kids lined up the block, first to wave and then to huck gravel by handfuls. Their parents stood stock still on their porches, as if having their our old Impala chased after by marauding kids constituted some just farewell. The luxury of our vacation implied cheating on our part, a betrayal the whole town had every right to take personal. In the same way, our mountain house seemed to fancy. Nobody we knew had a second dwelling beyond a duck blind or a river trailer. A Denver banking family had built the cabin for summers of roughing it. But for me, it bespoke untold mystery. Gran granite stones in the foundation reminded me of some ancient castle. The root cellar would have been an impossibility in the leech-filled swamp, where digging introduced you to the water table after you hurled the first tablespoon of dirt over your shoulder. The living area was long enough to bowl in. Right off, Mother bought new sleek and curvy couches in burnt orange to break up the stretched out dog run feel of that room. The stone fireplace at the far end stood almost as tall as daddy. Within days, hired workmen clomped in to cut holes in the wall and installed picture windows all around till the house felt like an aquarium. The wood burning stove got swapped for gas. Mother had new tiles from Architectural Digest grouted together over the bathroom's rough hewn lumber. For a few weeks, we lived like characters in a Disney movie. At night, elk came down to rub their shredding antlers against the jack pine. Mornings, Lisa and I piled into my parents' separate beds to watch bears through their picture window. A mother grizzly ambled down the slope with her two cubs to root in our garbage every morning. Mother had left across that window the lumberyard's masking tape X, looking past which always made me think of our house as a treasure spot marked on some map that bears, ca bears carried around. We're in the middle of a the wilderness. At first light, I saw, sat on Daddy's twin bed next to his bony white feet poking from covers. The bottoms were torn, tough as horn. I didn't want them rubbing against me. Plus, I resented being exiled to Daddy's inert form when Lisa got to cuddle with Mother. I was a moist, unwashed child. If I'd tried to slide in with Mother, too, she'd have unwrapped my arms from her neck, saying I made her hot. One particular morning, we heard the bears scrambling across the pine needles and dust on the forest floor. Then, between the vaulted pines, the mother, the mother shape appeared in strobe-like flashes. She walked with a long stride. Her great shoulder muscles rolled under her fur. My spine instinctively stiffened at the sight. I froze that way, only relaxing once the cubs came scampering into view behind. The crash of the first garbage can roused Daddy from sleep. He roared up, shouting. In his foggy head, he thought the bear's hunched over shadow was a, a burglar. Before I could grab his leg moving by, he charged straight at the glass and commenced to pounding on it while we all gaped wordless. Maybe Mother said his name a few times, nothing much more than that, but he kept at it. Mired in whatever dream he was acting out, he yelled at that mama bear to get the hell out of his yard with such power that her cubs skittered behind her, leaving a trail of trash and melon rinds. This pissed the bear off. She sought to get Daddy's barking six-foot figure to back up. She reared to her full height, the ears slanted back, and she staggered toward that window, growling with her arms wide and with some great meat of her torso shimmying under glistening fur. For one second, she and Daddy stood about three feet apart, with only a sheet of glass and that masking tape X between them. The bear's muzzle made a puddle of frost a good foot higher than his black hair, which was all cowlicked around from sleep, making him seem especially goofy. I dove under the covers and prayed us all back to Leechfield, where the Lord sent sneaking water moccasins and black widow spiders to kill you with slow poison. At some point during my prayer, Daddy clicked awake, for when I pe peeked out, he was backing up from the window. 
The end of the bed hit behind his knees and made his legs bend, so he sat down. He looked addled. Still, the bear held her ground. She growled and showed her teeth and lacquered claws. We all sat breathing shallow till she cocked her head at Daddy, as if making her mind up. Finally, she reeled around and fell over heavy on her front paws and went shambling back up the mountains, her baby scrambling to keep up. Ooh, it's scary. Top of 182. At the mountain's base, you could rent stable horses for $7 a day. Mother was paralyzed with fear of riding anything not equipped with factory air. Still, she sashayed one bright morning into the tack room of this stable where the owner, a young cowboy named Rick McBride, was bent over mending the, a bridle. She had on her leopard skin coat at the time. She left the tack room... Tack room... <laughs> Sorry, I think that's funny. Um, she let the tack room door slam after her so the two of them were alone which caused a lot of hooting and cat calls among the hands standing around the corral when she came out she cut a deal to buy the two quarter horses lisa and i had already fallen in love with half brothers big enough was mine and the smaller of the two a chestnut bay with black points lisa got sure enough a dark red roan with a deeper chest and a little more jump if there's a particular joy that marks that whole dark Colorado time, it starts and ends with those horses. Unless you suffer from a dire case of physical fear, as mother did, in fact, as mother in fact did, you cannot heave yourself on the back of a horse without some jaw slackening wonder at the animal power of it. In pictures of the time, I look dumbly small perched on big enough. I had remembered myself as tall in the saddle, long legged and needing only the faint pressure of a knee and the slight flick of rain to turn. In fact, my legs didn't even reach a third of the weight around the horse's barrel-like girth. They practically stuck out sideways in the stirrups, which I always had to buckle up on the shortest length. From my first whiff of that stall every morning, horse shit and mud that pissed on straw, that pissed on straw that smells so much like beer, I drew enough horse up into my lungs to be some form of drunk on it. If Mr. McBride was shoeing something nearby, you could hear horseshoe and hammer and anvil clanging together, or the steady rasp of his file against hoof. Otherwise, the only sounds were animal, the plop of green manure at odd intervals, a sleeping, sleeping mare shifting its weight foot to foot, some pony's muzzle banging around in its empty feed trough, making a padded thump against the wood bin. We learned pretty quick to leave off the wearing of cowboy boots for the dudes from Chicago and Los Angeles, so my tennis shoes sunk down in the muck and then sucked up with every step. Mud tended to seep over the tops. It wet my white bandlawn socks. I can still see Big Enough's shiny chestnut rump as I smoothed it, my hand over it. I had to climb a few boards up on the stall side to accomplish this, saying, easy, easy. I spent some minutes with a curry comb on his broad neck before backing him out of the stall. Horses are blessed with an alert expression. This despite the fact that they aren't half as smart as, say, a pig. Any halfway lonesome child who curry combs some, rough, some rows in the dust cake caked on a horse's broad neck or takes a minute to rub the white star on a forehead is prompted by this look to feel that the horse loves and understands her as no one else. This myth is especially easy to fall into if the horse is steady and good-natured enough to take said kid on long rides without trying to scrape her off against a tree or otherwise showing fret over the burden of her. I liked to ride bareback, with nothing more than a hackamore, but saddling that horse every morning was a public ritual that proved my competence to any bystanders. Maybe it was my first real competence at anything. I hitched big enough to the front stable post beforehand in case of, in case any of the cowboys wanted to watch me achieving this. First, you centered the Mexican blanket across his spine. Then you heaved the saddle over that. Actually, I needed Lisa's help with this. We had to drag two chairs from the office to stand on. The weight of the saddle was such that we had to heave ho together so its speed was swing it up 
across the horse before it fell in the dust. Then you hooked the left stirrup onto the saddle horn in order to buckle the belly cinch, which with my horse always involved whacking him on the stomach a few times. For he had learned to fake a bloat for the tourists in order that the saddle be belted on loose. This caused folks to slide off mid-ride. A few whacks, though, and he'd suck in his gut so you could buckle up. You slipped the remaining strap through a small sliver, nope, small silver ring on the saddle side. You looped this around and knotted a flat knot. Then you let the stirrups flap back down off the horn. Mr. McBride or his wife Polly always came around before I rode off to see how many fingers they could wiggle under the cinch and to tighten the saddle accordingly. The bridle came last, for the longest while while the McBrides had to do that part, but I finally learned to get my horse to take the bit in his mouth by finish by fishing from my Levi's pocket a sugar cube I stole each morning from the cafe where cowboys bought their eggs and where Lisa and I kept a running tab. I held the nickel bit inside a circle and made my thumb and index finger between, which I also pinched the sugar cane. I can still conjure the feel of his mouth on my fingers. It was both black velvety and bristly from his whiskers. It gave off a clover smell when he'd go to bite, which was my cue to slide the bit between his teeth. After you buckled his chin strap, you were ready to head up the mountains. Man, there's a lot of prep to ride your horse. That sense of trust I felt on Big Enough's back was new. Maybe because of that trust, I turned out to be a fairly decent rider. I was stupidly fearless and also had some innate balance built into me. I still have the red ribbon I won on the barrel races that July at the Gymkhana. Lisa took sixth in the Washington pole bendings, though she would have me point out here that the competition in her category was far stiffer than in mine, which was only little kids. All summer, Big Enough never threw me once though he was speared enough to rear at a chipmunk or gopher that crossed the trail and would go into the wild buck go into a wild buck at the sight of a racket of a bulldozer let's see and would go into a wild buck at the sight and racket of a bulldozer on the road a few times we got caught on the bridge that led back to the stable behind that kind of heavy equipment and i got to fancy myself a rodeo rider the fact of my never being thrown speaks more or how close more to how close I'd paid attention. I'd become a watchful child prone to clutch the saddle horn at any sign of trouble than to any real skill on my part. We rode every day higher than I now think was safe. We rode we rode with neither guide nor map. The horses could always find the way back to water and oats. The landscape was various in a way that had never seemed possible under the empty east Texas sky. After every stand of trees, another vista opened up. There were wide meadows that could lope that there were wide meadows we could lope across, scaring up jackrabbits as we went, and narrow paths of rock that our horses took like ballerinas high stepping. There was even a cave with a small muddy opening that widened out into a vast cathedral like cavern of red rock. We took bag lunches out there and flashlights we tied to the back of our saddles. Once, we built a fire with dead wood and pine needles and paper matches from the cafe. But at some point, we figured that the squeaking and clicking noise above us came not from the few high nests of nocturnal birds, but from a ceiling hung with fruit bats. The twin circles of light from our flashlights dragged across the mass of them chittering. They were red-eyed as the nutria rats I'd seen. Our kids, when we finally backed out of the cave, made no more sound than the pair of Indian ghosts we'd been hunting for. Another time, we hobbled our horses outside an abandoned mine. We fo followed the cart tracks deep inside, where we found next to a solid wall of fool's gold a slackened rubber, which I mistook for, <laughs> which I mistook for the skin of a snake. In fact, I toted that rubber back to the stable like a trophy and made the cowboys laugh and hoo-haw. We stumbled onto waterfalls and clear mountain streams too cold for swimming, but which we loved for wading and drinking. Being a different order of water entirely from the brackish bayous and soggy Gulf of Mexico I'd known. You could see a rainbow trout whipping around under the surface and could drink from two hands till your gullet was full and your ankles and knuckles ached, <laughs> ached from the blue cold of it. 
Of course, when trouble hit, we were on our own. In one rocky pass, our horses grazed while we watched a herd of wild goats. All of a sudden, both horses started up from chomping in on chomping in one jangled motion. Their ears pricked forward and their necks arched high as if they breathed in something evil and hoped to see it coming. At some point, Big Enough flattened his ears back up against his head. Sure enough, started crab walking. A black cloud slid across the blue sky like some flat plate of steel. When the sky finally broke open, it brought down hailstones the size of baseballs, making us double over in our saddles and spooking the horses even worse. We dismounted and tried to wait out the storm under some trees. Lisa even taught me how to count that space and time between the lightning hit and the thunder sounded. Since that interval was getting littler, she told me the storm was moving toward us at a good clip and should therefore pass overhead as fast it is as it had come. But when a bright white line struck a dead trunk in a clearing, we could have spit at it and hit. We fell to earth and covered our heads. The horses jerked from the reins jerked the reins from our hands and went clopping away down the mountain. We hiked three or four miles down that trail of foot, hatless soaked through our jean jackets. The temperature had dropped. We got to the stable blue-lipped and shivering. I toweled off in the office. What if we got hurt? I asked Mr. McBride. He said the bobcats tended to drag the bigger bones and carcasses up past the timber line, but that buzzards and vultures would usually clue in a search team as to where to where to hunt. <laughs> that is grim. Another time, we were racing some kids bareback. Lisa on a borrowed roan named George, when a nasty little tar heel hurled a garter snake at that horse, who reared and toppled over on Lisa, snapping her collarbone. Yikes! Under the yoke of Lisa's white blouse, the bone poked the skin as if to pierce it. But when we found Mother sipping a vodka Gibson at the cowboy bar, she just offered Lisa some baby aspirin from her purse. Doctors would no doubt screw it up, she said. She didn't think that bone could set, be set anyway. And would we like some cherry Cokes? To which we said no thanks. I can still see Lisa's face, pale and tearless, with a streak of amber clay along her jaw, when it dawned on her that nobody was fixing to take up the cause of that busted bone. She held that arm in front of her, like it was a piece of furniture. Let's see, a much longer. I don't know. Maybe 15, 20 minutes. The bartender in that place was a handsome black-haired Mexican named Hector, or Hector maybe, who had been reading Mother's Palm when we came in. We set Mother's hand towel, nope, not hand towel, that's the next line, uh, <laughs> he set mother's hand down long enough to make Lisa a sling out of a bar towel. That towel stank faintly of sour gin and had a candy stripe of red grenadine up the front. Ictor also punched open the register and gave us quarters for the jukebox, but we took them the hell out of there and bought bomb pops back at the stable instead. Other than times like this, when we waited a straight-thinking adult, when we wanted a straight-thinking adult but couldn't find one, we felt safe enough. We also stopped keeping such close watch on our parents. I failed to notice, for instance, that we never saw them together. Daddy sometimes hung around the stable to drink coffee with Mr. McBride, for Daddy could tell a mare's age by staring into her mouth, guess a stallion's weight within 20 pounds, and reckon how many hands high a gelding stood. Daddy had broken cutting... Daddy had broken cutting horses as a young man, and this earned him a measure of cowboy respect despite his being a Texan, which was reprehensible to most of the hands. Mr. McBride even loaned Daddy his very own blue-spotted Appaloosa free of charge one day to take Lisa and me riding in the mountains. We tied our horses before a county store with an honest-to-God cracker barrel inside. Daddy paid the man to make us roast beef sandwiches on Wonder Bread. He used grainy mustard and thin slices of red onion. Ooh, that sounds good. We also bought tins of pink salmon eggs and rented fly, fly rods and waders for trout fishing. Which remains about the only sport I've ever whipped Lisa at right off. 
Whatever reflex makes her sharp with a gun, she can still pluck a dove from a tree. Made her restless in the water. Standing around just bored her. She needed more to do. That afternoon, the canvas bag I'd slung around my neck quickly filled up with the shining bodies of flopping trout. When I could no longer carry it, I waded back to the bank to leave it with Lisa, who'd given up and broken out the sandwiches. I nearly laid down my rod, too. That would have been a mistake, for the last fish I hauled out of the water that day must have weighed five pounds and was all fight. Daddy laughed like hell when it hit. My rod bent double. I staggered out into deeper water, hollering for help. Had to wade back to the bank first and get rid of his pole before he could reel the fish in for me. <laughs> I did manage to get the net under it myself. Together, we dragged it flopping on the grassy bank, where it smacked its tail and made Lisa sidestep with an odd daintiness. She actually said, ick. Daddy grabbed its tail in two sure hands to whack its head on a rock. Then it lay still, eyes staring ahead, its gills puffed in reflex. It was not like the old fish that poet Elizabeth Bishop once wrote about, battered and venerable and homely, with the long mustache of a mandarin. Nor did it have the bulk that thrilled Hemingway in a tuna. But as fish go, it was close to perfect, being clean silver in the sun with that rainbow stripe all pink and blue and yellow green melted right into its unnicked scales and not a square inch of moss or tatter to mar it. It resembled some rare Chinese artifact, the way its scales overlocked so neat, like some jeweler had taken a soldering iron to assemble it, one scale at a time. Daddy didn't even suggest I gut or scale it. He wanted to haul it back whole to the country store, figuring the old man who'd rented us our gear would get a kick out of it. Daddy even carried that fish dangling by the gills into the store, spread it up flat out for the fellow's meat counter. He put both his hands on my shoulder and said that Pokey here had caught that one. The man nodded and called his wife from the back and she nodded. Then we all stood around nodding a while till the man started giving the names of various taxidermists, at which point Lisa said she could have, could she have an Eskimo pie? Even after Daddy bought the ice cream for her, she was all sold up, arms crossed tight across her sweatshirt, her lower lip stuck out about two inches in front of her chin. And it was that lip led us out of the damp store into the bright afternoon. That evening, Daddy gathered kindling for a fire on a boulder about 50 yards up the mountain behind the house. Night was falling. He put Lisa and me in charge of puffing on the little fire he lit till it blazed. While we went down to the house for a skillet, we squatted on our haunches and played Indian. I can still make out the loose limbed shape of Daddy as it came to me through, through the smoke of that green kindling. He moved between the trees, toting the iron skillet up the mountain. He was long-legged and sure-footed and made no sound. Once the fire was high, Daddy swamped each little fish carcass around in a pie tin of cornmeal, then fried it in Crisco. I was hungry as only a day on horseback can make you. Canopy of evergreen, evergreens waved overhead. Stars were bobbing into view in between. The fire kept popping to send whole handfuls of sparks skittering, skittering up the air. We ate with our fingers off paper plates. The cooked trout gave off a steamy crunch for they were small and crusty. I kept spitting out the, the spiny bones. The night air was cold. He had to cool every bite down to chew to a chewable temperature by taking that air in between your teeth with a hiss. This made a nasty noise. Lisa said I sounded like a mule with a feed bag hooked over my hooked over my ears. And Daddy said, "Talk about the pot calling the kettle black." And what might have been a fight evaporated right there, rose up with the smoke, and dispersed. <laughs> dispersed through all those waving evergreens. I'm gonna finish quickly here. He saved my big fish for last and made a ceremony out of cooking it, which he had to do in halves to fit the pan. Even then, the tail loped over the edge and burnt. It was the meatiest fish we ate that night with the greatest portion of white flesh to spiky bones. Lisa and I ate it while he worked up a skillet full of thin sliced red potatoes along with Vidalia onions he quartered. 
I can still see Daddy scraping at those potatoes, which would keep the smoky fish taste from the lard. He was singing Good Night Irene under his breath, staring into the skillet with that faraway look, watching the sky arch above us through the pines. I thought about a passage I read in the encyclopedia Grandma about us, how the Rockies were formed by glaciers sliding across the continent to rake up zillions of tons of rock. I pictured one one moving slow as white silk across where we sat. Maybe God dropped that boulder off right here, I wrote in my diary the next day, for us to cook on. Comfort makes fools of us that way, and a kid gets faith that quick. At one point, Daddy said to hush, and through the far pines, lit by a three-quarter moon, we made out the butt blunted antlers of a moose, which struck me as noble in its big-jawed ugliness. It chewed in profile, slow as a ball player. Sometime later, a bob bobcat even yowled, close enough to make me scoot up under Daddy's arm, which we, which fear made him laugh and say nothing was going to bother me, and I believed him. All right, I think I'm gonna... No, 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 I'm gonna go down to the end of this bottom of this page because it kind of switches directions but let's at least get through them like finishing up their meal and stuff after we ate daddy stroked the fire again he lay back on a jeans jacket he'd balled up and sipped at a silver whiskey flask lisa and i undid a couple of wire coat hangers for marshmallows i roasted three at a time dipping them right in the fire they blazed and cooked black on the outside but inside were nothing but goo lisa was more even in approach. She toasted them singly, singly to a pale gold color. She even bent one end of the hanger so it had a rotary handle she could turn like an honest-to-God spit. For once, that difference struck me okay without sinking me into a swamp of worry about how might it augur about my character or lack of character. She even told me while she sat twisting her spit that mine was one hell of a fish and Daddy agreed. We fell asleep beside him on that unlikely cold stone, both full as ticks on fish and potatoes, each snuggled under an armpit, our heads on his chest. He still smelled of horse. A few times, some coal crumbling in on itself caused me to jerk awake. Then I saw sparks surge up in a tower and felt Daddy draw our football jackets up around, up over our shoulders. Otherwise, he lay still, the flask balanced on his breastbone at the perfect angle so he could sip steady without lifting his head or spilling down his chin. I don't recall his scrubbing the skillet out with sand and pine needles, nor getting carried down the mountain. And we'll stop there. It is right at the bottom of page 190, right before that last paragraph starts. All right.